good afternoon and thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me here. I'm really delighted to, to be back in Cork. It, it is my hometown. I grew up in St. Luke's just across the river, not too far from here. And it's really a pleasure to be here, uh, um, to not just to speak in Cork, but at such an important event to see the energy around these new projects that are developing. So it's terrific. Also, I'd like to just highlight the, this facility we stand in. I, I've not been to Parky Creeve before, but I'm just blown away by the, uh, by the facility. It's really world class. And congrats to Cork and to our friends in the GA. It's fantastic to have it here. So I, I, my talk is slightly different, Amanda, from the one that you had uh, on, on your list. But it's really a clinical talk. But, but it's, uh, I make no apologies to the fact that it is laced with a small dose of health economics. And I'll, I'll explain my thinking there. I, um, but in short, I think we as clinicians and in medics, uh, as medics, we really do have to begin to understand the language of the health economists and the policy makers if we're going to make changes that are sensible. Because um, if we don't figure out how they make their decisions, I don't think we can help them to deliver better uh, care for our patients. But at heart, this is a clinical talk. And I'm going to use prostate cancer as my um, clinical example for measuring outcomes for value and quality in patients and in cancer care. Um, but it really could be anything else, uh, any other uh, malignancy. So there's a lot of themes that people talk about these days that are, are, are current and topical. Patient-centered care is one, personalized medicine another. I remember this one here, uh, money follows the patient. We don't hear too much about that anymore, but a couple of years ago that was the buzz. And you do hear a good bit uh, in the US and globally about value-based healthcare, but if I talk to health economists in Ireland or policymakers in Ireland about value-based healthcare, I don't know if it's just me, but their eyes completely glaze over and uh, I don't seem to be able to communicate to them what we mean by that. When you talk about value, though, I, I, I think it's, it's important to understand that value is different things to different people. And uh, if you're going to tie the cost of treatments to the outcomes of the patient, you have to decide on what basis should the, should the money actually follow the patient. What are we going to reward? Are we going to reward access? Are we going to reward more timely care? Or are we going to reward better care? Mm -hmm. And the old chestnut from Einstein, I think, is really valid here. Not everything you can count is really important. And I think that's, that's uh, rife in our world now. We're up to our necks in KPIs and, and process-related metrics. And I've no doubt these things are important when you're running a hospital. But I've yet to meet a patient who really cares about whether or not he got his CAT scan on day four and he was within 72 hours of finding a bed at, uh, um, after his operation and so forth. So I think we need to refocus the, the this conversation onto the stuff that matters to patients. When you look around Ireland and the landscape here in terms of uh, this sort of topic, the only people you find who are actually being held to this sort of standard are, uh, oddly enough, pharmaceutical industry and the medical tech industry. If they want to introduce a new therapy, they've got to be able to navigate this whole uh, horizon, otherwise the government and the payers won't cover it. So uh, we'll just jump in with that as a backdrop. Uh, I would say that value and quality, I regard the two of them as synonymous almost. You won't get value unless you're delivering high quality. Um, I'm, I was delighted to hear my other clinician speakers, fellow sp clinicians, talking about this earlier on, and I want to throw in my two cents worth on it. So what does value mean to doctors, and how do doctors decide uh, um, and clinicians decide what's good value? Is surgery better than radiotherapy or chemo better than radiation, and how do we decide that? Uh, regulators, it's a whole different story. What do they, how do they decide that they're going to build a particular kind of facility? Someone asked me about proton beam earlier on. Should we have one of those? Um, uh, you know, should we be investing more surgical centers, more diagnostic centers? What do, th what do the regulators and the, and the funders value? Um, uh, you have other uh, groups that are in the UK and around the US and, and Europe that make these decisions. As I say, it's sort of embryonic here, but I'm sure it's coming our, our way. Um, and then the last and critically the most important thing in my book is how do patients decide what's a good value? And, and for them, they're not really as focused on value as in money. I think they really mean what's the best quality. And I, I think that's really critical. Uh, how does a patient... One of the worst kept secrets in medicine, I think, is that those of us inside this room probably get a better deal than people who are not involved in the business. Let's be honest. People ring us all the time and they say, you know, Uncle Billy has got this and who should he see and where should he go? And we try our best to say, well, you might go over here, you might go over there. But the general public and the person who has the condition doesn't really have any place they can go to decide whether uh, they should go for 
a particular uh, disease treatment or a particular hospital or facility. So that's what we're about. Well, we, in our group, our research group in Galway kind of decided to tackle this now 12 years ago, and I'm stunned at how fast the time has gone by. And we decided to structure it in two studies. One is a retrospective study of uh, a particular technique for prostate cancer called brachytherapy, which I'll explain to you a bit more detail. And then secondly, and halfway through, a prospective cohort study to see if we could take the learnings from the retrospective study and design a suite of metrics that would allow us to measure value. The goal is to help a patient make a better choice and to help the policymakers to make better decisions about what we're going to spend money on. So let's take a, a, a step back to the space shuttle uh, view and just see what, what's prostate cancer looked like in Ireland. It has an oddly eccentric distribution, as you can see from the map there. You won't see this on the screens, but up on, on here, uh, for some reason it seems to be skewed uh, it, more toward the periphery than you might think. Uh, for whatever reason, if you look at the, at the county distribution, Galway has the highest incidence for whatever reason, and Wexford has the lowest. It can't be the sun. I, I, I don't know what that is, but anyhow, maybe it is the sun. Um, uh, but it, it has a, uh, we're very, Ireland has the highest, uh, amongst the highest incidence and prevalence of prostate cancer in Europe. So this is a big deal uh, for us. Uh, just like Cork has more colorectal cancer, uh, Ireland seems to have uh, as much or more prostate cancer than anybody else for whatever reason. And it affects and involves the care of about 3,000 newly diagnosed men a year. And if you can see on the survival curves down here, we're actually doing a bit better than we were. This is national cancer. Uh, registry data and you see over the last number of years we've actually uh, pulled things up a bit and the vast majority of the patients I see thank goodness uh, live and are cured or at least survive 10 or more years with the condition uh, unfortunately still plenty of our patients relapse and uh, so by no means is this problem resolved but uh, at least in my clinic mostly when I'm dealing with prostate cancer it is a pretty mobile and uh, early staged uh, patients so the options for managing prostate cancer, for those of you who are not directly involved, uh, if you catch it early enough, there may be a cohort of men we don't actually have to intercede right away, the so-called active surveillance, or we used to call watchful waiting. Uh, obviously, surgery remains a gold standard, both open, laparoscopic. We saw beautiful images for, from uh, Brian earlier on about the evolution of surgery, and, and it's, uh, it's alive and well in prostate cancer uh, in the form of the da Vinci robot. Um, radiation has evolved. Dwight gave a gorgeous discussion about how we went from, when I learned as a resident in the late 80s uh, at NCI, it was very much two and four field treatments, very simple, um, made our own lead blocks and all that, and look, it's very different now. So everything has evolved, and there's a whole range of other things that you can do for prostate cancer uh, that are perhaps less studied. Now, one thing is, let's say, okay, if there's 3,000 newly diagnosed cancer patients, how much do we spend nationally on this? That would be one estimate of value, very crude. Turns out this is a paper I was involved in from Galway, Rochelle Burns, and they did a cost analysis nationally, and it looks like we're not far off 50 million uh, euro being spent. And one of the things that kind of interested me in this slide is look at the amount on hormone therapy, which is very interesting. It's, it's almost the biggest single item that we purchase in this country, which was a little bit counterintuitive for me in the management of this disease, especially since hormones are very much a double-edged sword in this, in this business. But that's uh, one way to look at it. Um, the, the way we approach it in Galway, and I'm, I'm looking back at our program over the last decade or so, is we, how do you choose between these different techniques? Well, you really have to risk stratify your patients. Uh, there's no one right size uh, or one right treatment for prostate cancer, so you really have to risk stratify your patients. And we do this really on the basis of fairly straightforward issues. One is the, the grade of the tumor. The higher the grade, the more likely it is to, to devolve beyond the gland, and that affects your treatment choices. Um, uh, the PSA, blood testing effects of the MRI, is very important. And on the basis of these uh, clinical features, you can really uh, subdivide the cancer into very low, all the way from low to high risk uh, of spread and recurrence of the disease. And that really helps us decide how to treat it. But just briefly to look this is not unique to Galway, but how do we approach radical prostatectomy is really available for all localized stages, be low to high. External beam radiation, uh, maybe in the intermediate and high risk, you might add hormonal therapy. Um, for, for my high risk patients, I tend to use a, a combination of hormonal medicine, external beam radiation, and brachytherapy, uh, so-called triple therapy. And I'll show you some data from our group, which uh, would, so I think, support the use of that approach in our patients. So this is, the, this is the, the playing field for a patient diagnosed with prostate cancer. 
Now, it's far enough away from lunch that I think I can show this video and not upset too many people, but uh, it, ta it takes about a minute and a half. And this is what brachytherapy actually looks like. It involves an ultrasound-guided technique through the rectum, transrectal ultrasound, putting the needles through the perineum, which uh, you will see. I don't know if I can show it here, but the movie is blocking it. And then using this ultrasound to basically image the prostate, as you can see it in the top right-hand corner there. Then via a template and through the perineum, we introduce these needles. All of this, by the way, is done under general anesthesia in the operating theater. It takes about an hour to do the case. I'll do four of them in, in the Galway Clinic tomorrow. The patients will come in tonight, and they'll all have left the hospital, I hope, before I do tomorrow afternoon. So it's a one-day procedure, and three-quarters of our patients are done in that one day. So it's not several weeks of uh, external beam radiotherapy, and it's not uh, an operation that requires at least a few days in the hospital, if not more. This is just uh, outlining the target. Dale would be very well familiar with this technique, because Dale and I uh, both do the same type of real-time planned uh, technique. This is a kind of an integrated view of our target in the computer simulator before we start. Um, that's the red prostate simulator, and the, the green pipe is actually the urethra running down the middle of the gland from the bladder into the penis, how the uh, urine drains from the prostate. This is a little bit of magic behind the scenes. You plan the implant, which fortunately will be over very shortly, I hope. And then you go ahead and you introduce radioactive seeds uh, throughout the prostate, and those seeds, or brachytherapy seeds or pellets, deliver a very focal, very high dose of radiotherapy in the most, I would argue, the most conformal fashion to the prostate gland because you're putting them actually into the target you're trying to treat, which is the gland. Uh, even though I use plenty of external beam radiotherapy, and uh, uh, there you have to aim the beam from outside. The actual seed implantation process itself, using this particular technique, is very low-tech. It's, uh, it's like an old cartridge rifle where you put the uh, seeds in through the needles uh, using something called a MIC applicator. And you, the advantage is you can see exactly where they're going on the ultrasound screen. Um, and then by the end of the case, you should have a nice implant. So as I say, this thing takes, uh, in total, um, f anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half, depending on the size and shape of the gland and so on. And we'll do three to four of these in a morning session in theater, uh, which makes it, I think, a pretty efficient use of time. And the patient's entire treatment course in three quarters of the patients is done in that one day, which I think patients feel and find uh, is quite appealing. This is just a, a depiction of the dose cloud showing you the 100% uh, dose cloud is now nicely covering the prostate. And most of the time, we're able to achieve that very, very nicely with the help of our physicists in the operating theater. So that's, that's what it looks like. Let's take a look now about how others are judging value and quality. And this is uh, some work that I've been involved with, with a group called ICHAM, the International Consortium for Health Outcomes Measurement in, um, in Boston, uh, under the direction of the Harvard Medical Group, and a fellow called Michael Porter, who is a bit of a rock star in the health economics world. And, and he is a person who's been leading the charge on trying to bring in this value concept for healthcare. And he defines value as an outcome that matters to a patient divided by the cost of obtaining that outcome. And he makes the point forcibly that that has to be decided per disease. You can't have one outcome for a whole hospital or one value for a whole hospital. You've got to go disease by disease. Um, but it's a fairly simple equation. We, I got involved in the prostate working group um, about, gosh, five or six years ago now. And we helped to come up with a set of metrics um, or a set of uh, measurements that we thought you would need to measure a full suite of outcomes for value that patients would care about and everybody would agree on. And uh, you might say, okay, that's great. Everybody's doing this now. It turns out very few people are doing it. There's an example of a surgical clinic in Germany called the Martini Clinic in Hamburg, and they've been doing this type of measurement for years, and they've shown very elegantly that they can improve their outcomes and quality by strict adherence to these uh, measurements and then feedback um, education as they go. But that's very much the rarity. What are the rest of us measuring? I'm afraid we're still stuck in the world of process and KPIs. Of almost 700 uh, uh, quality met metrics assessed in a NQF uh, study recently, only about 100 of them had anything to do with outcomes that a patient would care about, i.e. Um, survival or morbidity. So it's really, uh, most people, what we're measuring for quality is much more about how we run our organizations. Not to single out the NCCP, but, but uh, uh, they are no different, or the NHS and any of the other health organizations. Mostly we're starting in the NCCP at the idea of access, how, how much access you can see in the top right-hand corner, 
how quickly you can get into the service, and then do you have all of the documentation and the wherewithal to get the right treatment. Now that will evolve eventually toward a much more uh, real-time quality um, uh, program, but it, it's very much in its infancy, I think, globally at the moment. So how do doctors determine value? Well, we, we use a much more kind of medically familiar paradigm of everything from a background opinion or expert view all the way through case and cohort studies, through randomized control trials, and ultimately systematic review. So we have an evidence-based pyramid that we like to quote. Unfortunately, we quote it all the time, but it's very rarely available in, in, the, in the areas that we want it. So, and this is an example in prostate cancer. This is a paper by the late Peter Grimm where he gathered up all of the outcomes and the dots are, each dot is a study and the higher up the, the page the study is, the better the outcome is and the different colors are the different techniques. But you can see we're all over the map. So how would a patient possibly look at that and decide I should have surgery versus radiation or brachy? It's not easy. So I'll quickly take you through our Galway uh, data and see if you're convinced that we have at least embryonically measured value here. So um, as I mentioned to you, you need to measure five domains to get value. One is you need to know who you're treating. It's very different replacing a hip or uh, repairing a hip in a 92-year-old a postmenopausal woman versus a 48-year-old athlete who's... So you have to know who you're actually treating, otherwise your results will be skewed. You need to go disease by disease, so value for one condition is not the same as value for another. And each of these metrics, each of these diseases has a specific set of metrics, all of which have to be defined and, and followed globally, or at least across a hospital system. Otherwise, we're all... It's like a Tower of Babel, we're all talking a different language here. You've got to measure the physician or the clinician's view of the chances of harm, or the CTCAE. And critically, and leading to my, nearly my title today, you need to measure PROMs, or patient reported outcome measures, and finally tie it all together with some kind of costs. So we started off uh, in 2006 with our BRACI program, and I, we've been gathering our data as carefully as we can. And I've just got the, in fact, today is the first view of, um, I'm very excited to show you this, because it's really data we're hoping to publish very soon on the first 1,000, 1,100 patients in our program. There's now about 1,500 in there and, uh, and climbing. So I think we have a good number of people. You can see that the typical prostate cancer patients, mid-60s, uh, low PSAs, about 700 of them had very low-grade disease. But you can see we didn't exclude anybody, even the way all the way up to the highest grade of tumor, uh, Gleason's 10, which is the worst prostate cancer. We accepted everybody, and all the way up to a PSA of 100, uh, which many people would question, but as long as I was convinced that the cancer was confined to the prostate on a good MRI, I thought brachytherapy made sense, and so that was the way we went. So here's a breakdown of our risk classification. You can see the bulk of these patients have low risk disease and should do well no matter what we do for them. But you can see in the left, uh, there's a few Gleason's grade, grade group 5, which is Gleason's 9 and 10, and these are bad actors and Gleason's 8 are also bad actors. So we've got a full spectrum of patients here. And here's the disease-free survival curve for the whole group uh, of 1,100 patients. And we're not far off 9, not far off 10 years now. And that's pretty decent, I think, because this includes some very bad actors here. Um, and if you break them down by disease group, I'll make a couple of things, if you can still hear me here. The top uh, curves here, these are the Gleason, the lowest grade group in red, and the funny color underneath it is the second lowest. That relapse rate is about 2%, 3% at five, six years. I mean, the biggest criticism I'd make of this data is that we're treating the wrong people because you could argue many of these guys didn't need to be treated. The answer to that uh, issue, though, I think, I hope, is that we're at least we're not hurting them because our toxicity rates are quite good. But you can see the higher grade patients, and this is the worst group here, the, uh, the uh, purple group, very small numbers, these are Gleason's 9s and 10s. We're still at five years showing about 80% disease control. And I would think that's not too bad. If it holds up, uh, it shows at least that's as good and non-inferior to other things for those patients. So here's how you traditionally break them up into low, intermediate, and high risk. And again, those data are tracking very nicely. The lower risk groups coming out at seven, eight years now, still well excess of 95% in remission, which is good. Now, how do we measure the quality in terms of uh, patient-reported outcome measures? And we picked one metric, which thankfully is still one that people use. It's called the EPIC questionnaire, which patients fill out at baseline and at regular intervals. And this is an example of this uh, metric being used in the New England Journal paper from a number of years ago, updated recently by Freddie Hamda, um, and showing basically that you get a temporary shortness, um, a short decrement in quality of life 
with all modalities for treating prostate cancer, but it quite rapidly gets better. Now, one thing is I've tried to use these curves to show to patients, and they just gaze at you blankly. It's a, like a clothesline heading off into the distance. What does that mean? Where would I fit? So I think we have to get better, and we'll show you some data that I think we'll hope I hope we'll show you that we are trying to get a bit more sophisticated about how we use analytics to show these data back to patients. Well, here's our patient reported outcome measures using the EPIC, and I, I won't belabor this one, but you can see we can very nicely measure, this is at two months, three months, six months, 18 months, th uh, sorry, that's a year, two and three years. You basically, if we can see changes in obstructive symptoms, you would expect that when you put seeds in a patient, they get irritated and they pee more frequently, and that's usually in the first six months. But look, it gets better. We cause no incontinence. We cause very little changes in other domains. So at least we can measure that, and that's out over, that's 500 patients, 473 patients over about three years. And that work is ongoing and growing as we, as we speak. But how do you show that in a cohesive way? And this is work done by Michael Porter and our colleagues at MD Anderson. And they've tried to link the different functions, including cost, in something called a spider plot, which allows you to basically um, compare, for example, brachytherapy with, say, proton therapy and robotic prostatectomy in this group. And looking at, for example, uh, all of the good outcomes would be, if everything was good, low cost, et cetera, it would be at the outside of the spider. Anytime it dips in, something's not quite so good. And I think that's a reasonable visual way to do that. So we took a look at this and they said, oh, can we use this to show our toxicity? These are graded toxicities done by the clinicians uh, over time. Um, and basically, you can't really show this to a patient until you show them. I don't know if this, can, is that, uh, can that be moved back, uh, Dara? That, or is that me? Am I doing something there? Okay. Um, so we'll just press on. So look, on this, uh, on this spider plot, we're looking at the various things that can happen to patients. Urgency, frequency, urinary retention, proctitis, incontinence, diarrhea, etc. And a bullseye would be right at the center, zero toxicity. All patients grade zero every time you survey them. Thank you. Uh, so look, this is at six months. You think, all right, a lot of frequency, good bit of urgency, 70%, 100% frequency, fair bit of urinary retention, although this wasn't catheters. This just was they couldn't empty their bladder properly. But look what happens with time to these, uh, um, to these scores. It actually, at a year, is starting to improve, at a year and a half, at two years, at two and a half years, at three years, at four years, at five years, at six years out from the, you can see that we're doing really very well. Most of them are grade zeros, and there's a few grade ones and twos in the rectal area, which you might expect. A couple of long-term urinary retention people but I can show that to a patient and it means something to them. They can see, oh, okay, well, I've got it now, but in a few years I'm going to feel better. I think this is something we will we're continue to develop uh, along the way. Now, that's a whole, an average score. And a patient would say, that's fine, but that's your average of a 1,000 Irishmen in Galway. What about me? I'm Jewish and I live in New York. and uh, Am I going to be the same way? Well, <coughs> actually, for them, you've got to come up with a tolerance interval. You've got to see how an individual might look. And so we're playing around with the idea that you can say this might be the, the best individual and this might be the worst individual and the average is somewhere in the middle and a, a person can plug in their numbers and see with a, with a, a tolerance interval where they might fit. So the last little bit of this in my last couple of minutes, I hope I'm still okay, Amanda, are we? Have a minute or two? So how do we tie in the cost? And this is where it gets a bit woo-woo-ish for a physician, but I'll do my best. So the, the, uh, the, the we're very clear on measuring quality in the clinic. So PROMS, patient reported outcome measures, CTCAE, you know, survivals, death rate at 90 days, uh, five year survivals, 10 years, so we, we get all that. But how do we convert that into money? And you know, it's, very, it's not as easy as it, as it sounds. You can't just measure the cost the insurance company pays you or the government allows the hospital because it's sliced and diced in a million different ways. So we've got to find some way to link the cost to the effectiveness, and that is in the average health econom economist uh, term, cost utility or cost effectiveness evaluation. So we've got to somehow link the PROMS to a quality adjusted life year or quali, and then into something called utility, or sorry, into utility and then into something called a quali, and then you can get a, a cost effectiveness utility. So I won't belabor this point, but there is a way to do it. It turns out we were measuring some of the wrong things and we weren't measuring some of the right things. So halfway through our study, we started to add in a utility measure, which is a health economics measure. And it's a much more general thing. You see, we're asking about mobility and self-care and usual activities and pain and discomfort. 
Now, most of my patients don't have any problems here, but there's a little visual analog scale, and they will at least pick a number uh, of zero being the worst health state imaginable to 100 being the best. And they'll pick a number down, and that number will change with time, and it might just give us a signal that says what the utility change of our treatments will be. And that can be linked with our EPIC data and another one called porpoise, which we're now measuring in prostate. And that, I hope, will get us to a cost-utility equation and some measure of value that we can talk to the uh, payers and the, the quality individuals about. So where are we going in, in, in the future? Well, I think I mentioned patient tools and how does this help a patient decide between there's almost equipoise between surgery, radiotherapy, and brachytherapy in early stage patients. But we know certain patients, if they get a choice, will opt for one over the other. On what basis do they make that decision? And there is another health economics uh, technique called decision, uh, sorry, um, uh, from behavioral economics called discrete choice experiments, where you can design a kind of a, uh, put a bunch of options and scramble them uh, in, a, in a, a deck of cards. And over a long number of patients, over a lot of choices, you can get a signal that tells you what, what are the real drivers of people's choices. So we've added that in into our program. So the discrete choice experiment, I think, will also help us to decide and help a patient decide how would they choose between these apparently equal uh, choices. Now, my last uh, thought here is there's a lot of talk about personal medicine, personalized medicine, and I'd like to consider with you the idea of bidirectional personalized medicine because there's a lot of information for a patient about what's the ideal treatment. Should it be, you know, Herceptin or Taxanes or this chemotherapy or that, or should it be Brachy or Stereotactic? And they can go online and they can have their genes sequenced and their uh, genomics and tumor sequenced, and there's a lot of things that will maybe point toward personalizing the treatment. And it could be very, very sophisticated. But what does a patient do with that? I mean, if they know they need a very sufficient, uh, sophisticated treatment that's available in Memorial or, you know, wherever, and they take it down to their nearest hospital and they meet one of the surgeons that Brian mentioned in his slides who's in the red zone of the, uh, then all bets are off because the game is over before they get to the chemo or the Herceptin or the gene-based therapy or the immune checkpoints or whatever. We have to pay attention to the quality at from the very beginning to the very end. And so I think personalized medicine, does, to me, doesn't mean anything unless you can find out the quality of the program to which the patient has to, uh, has to go. And, and I think we should be driving toward, and it was wonderful to hear earlier on our, our clinical colleagues say, we want the survival data. We want to show that the Bonds or the Galway Clinic or CUH or GUH or wherever has better results than you can get in Dublin or London. or And then people will choose us, and they should choose us. If we're, and if we're not as good, they shouldn't choose us. We're, I think, a long way from that, but we need to start measuring quality to get there. And for my money, personalized medicine currently expresses only half the story. You need to know where you're going, and we need to put our shingles up and let people know what we're doing with these various programs. So I'm going to close on that just to say I think we can, we can do the things. All of this work was done in a, in a busy, a couple of busy clinics. Many of my clinical colleagues are here today from Galway, and I appreciate them traveling down. Um, so this can be done. We did have the help of some academics in, uh, in NUI Galway, as I'll show you in this list here. A lot of these are health economists, and, um, and that's a very typical picture of, uh, of Galway on an on a average winter's evening. It's like for my American colleagues, like Lake Wobegon, where, where all the women are good looking and all the children are above average. So uh, uh, this is a really nice uh, picture of, of Galway. Anyhow, thanks for your attention. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, this is obviously patient-centered uh, care that we're talking about, and there's a lot of data, sophisticated looking data that you're considering using so that the patient can help decide what type mm. of treatments they're using um, or to go for. Um, what steps, if any, are you taking or have you taken um, to help the patient um, make that decision? So have you considered apps or software tools? Yeah, so... Uh, um, I think in the long run, it's possible that these technologies or this kind of data analytics and data would, would lend itself to an app. But I think that we, we really, we're a long way from that, I think, in, in uh, the programs that we're at at the moment. I think the steps we take now are the steps I hope everybody takes as we sit down with our patients. We have a you know, detailed consultation. There, there are cases discussed in an MDT, uh, an MDM. Uh, they see, in, in the case of prostate cancer, they'd meet a surgeon and a radiation oncologist usually they get a chance to hear both sides of the coin. And if they have trouble making the decision afterwards, 
there's usually others like GPs and uh, nurse practitioners and ANPs and so on that can help family members. It's amazing. A third of US patients, I'm, I'm told, uh, make their healthcare decisions on Yelp. Um, I was at the ICHAM meeting in, in Washington this year, and that slide was put up by the US News and World Report uh, produce a, a kind of a, score che a scorecard of, of, of performance in American hospitals every year in the different disciplines and, you know, what's number one and et cetera, all the way down. But it turns out that uh, the guy from the editor-in-chief of that journal said, they, you know, despite this kind of effort they go to, that a third of patients are deciding on Yelp. So like everything else in the world, you know, g the next generation or two generations younger than me, maybe three younger than me, make their decisions entirely differently from the way I think they should or the I think they, they ought to be or I think they will be. And a lot of it is online, a lot of it is on Facebook and Google and Yelp, and I think we are going to have to get, uh, get in line with that. But I, I think the important thing is the quality of the data going in. We have to know what we're doing first. And right now we quote uh, outcomes from papers done in other countries, in other eras, by other surgeons, and we, we advise our patients to pick surgery or pick radiotherapy or pick brachy based on this paper from Memorial or MD Anderson. But who knows whether we're actually doing the same, getting the same outcome uh, for those patients as that. So I think we, we've started, everybody's doing it now to some degree, um, and I think we really need to push on and, and, and uh, get the quality of the data that'll, not so much, uh, uh, there was a problem in the UK a number of years ago where they had trouble getting people in for thoracic surgery, so they did, went to great efforts to push them in quicker, and of course the outcomes got worse because people were getting faster surgery, but it was done by the wrong people or the wrong type of surgery. So it's not just about access. We're obsessed with access uh, here in this country at the moment for good reasons. It's about quality. And I, I think if we start to measure the right things, uh, then we can start to load them onto apps and patients could use them that way. Because you're right, that's where we're going, I think. Thank you very much. I know my colleagues are probably sick of me saying um, your data out is only as good as your data in. So um, thanks, Emilia. I'm going to pass over to Harry to introduce the next speaker.